Good evening and welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this evening for the first in a series of talks and events celebrating the medieval heritage of Cooper and District. I'm Vary Stewart, I'm the Head of Public Engagement at the University of St Andrews and it's my great pleasure to be hosting this event tonight. Shortly we're going to be hearing from Professor Rhiannon Purdy on the topic of Sir David Lindsay and the Squire at Struthers, local jokes for local people. Now before I introduce Rhiannon, I'd like to take a moment to recognise the organisations and activities of which these talks are only one aspect. In 2017, an interpretive plan for Cooper was published and is available on the Cooper Development Trust website. The plan confirmed previous reports which said that the medieval heritage of Cooper and District had not been sufficiently recognised. For example, the two most famous and respected writers in Scotland in the 16th century were Sir David Lindsay of the Mount Cooper and his cousin Robert Lindsay of Pitscotty. Both have been educated in Cooper's Priory and at Cooper's Grammar School. Sir David's play in Satire of the Three Estates, Scotland's first play, was first performed on Cooper's Castle Hill on the 7th of June 1552. The interpretive plan suggested a new production, which has now been commissioned and written, and is planned to be staged in 2022, 470 years after the first staging. Now, potential audiences should know that while the original play was six hours long, the new commission is a somewhat more manageable two hours. Eight local organisations represented here are all are from all over Cooper and District and encompasses the entire catchment area of Cooper's Bell Baxter High School. They have come together to research and promote the area's medieval heritage, starting with the Old Scots language. The logos of the eight are here on screen, along with that of Cooper Now, Cooper's unique digital improvement district, which has established itself since its arrival 18 months ago as the prime platform for communication across Cooper and District. On now to the main event. And it is my genuine pleasure to introduce Professor Rhiannon Purdy from the University of St Andrews School of English. Rhiannon has previously been a Fulbright Research Fellow at the University of Rochester, New York, and her main research interests are in older Scots literature, later Middle English literature and medieval romance. She's written numerous articles in these areas and is in addition the author of books on medieval Scots literature such as The Scots and Medieval Arthurian Legend. Rhiannon is currently working on a new book, An Introduction to Medieval Scots Literature, Origins to 1513, the very first full length history of medieval Scots literature. Her work will also involve her teaming up with the Scottish Qualifications Authority to introduce or reintroduce older Scots poetry to the higher and advanced higher English curriculum in a project which has been informally dubbed Older Scots for Modern Scots. Now, Rhiannon's going to start her talk in a moment, but I would say to our audience, please be aware there is a Q&A there and you are welcome to, to put your questions into the Q&A at any point in the talk and we'll come to those at the end. And I'd now like to invite Rhiannon to take centre stage and tell us more about tonight's subject, Sir David Lindsay and the Squire at Struthers, local jokes for local people. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Vary. Um, now the traditional moment where I faff about with the tech and try and share my slides, apologise, etc. Right, uh, okay. This should happen. And any minute now, it should go to presenter mode. Yeah. OK, I think you are seeing my title slide. Am I right? <laughs> OK. All right. So my talk tonight is uh, Sir David Lindsay and the Squire at Struthers, local jokes for local people. OK, uh, if anybody is curious about the poems I'm speaking about, these are two poems called uh, The History of Squire Meldrum and The Testament of Squire Meldrum. They're a little sort of diptych of poems by Sir David Lindsay of Satire of the Three Estates fame, uh, and they're available free online. You can also you can buy the actual book if you like, but they're available free online and there's the web address. So if I've piqued your interest, you can go and see them there. 
Uh, and the local map, this is taken from the 1654 Blau map, um, just showing you, well, Cooper, where we nominally are, <laughs> in our heads at least, I'm actually down here in Anstruther, uh, and Sir David Lindsay's seat of the mount, and then what's called Ochterother Struther in sort of 16th century records, but Struthers Castle down here, um, the seat of the Lord Lindsay of the Byers. Okay, so that's that's our map for where things are taking place or where this poem is written. I'm not sure how much introduction you need to Sir David Lindsay, but I'll just give you a little prologue of, of who he is and then who the subject of these poems are, is, was, uh, and what interests me about them. What is this business of local jokes for local people? So David Lindsay himself, uh, he's born probably 1486. Um, so he's writing in the first half of the 16th century. He was the usher, in other words, kind of the companion to the infant Prince James from his birth in 1512. So he's right at the centre of the royal court. Uh, he's not the tutor and you know, he's not he's not the he's not the formal education guy. He is the fun guy. He is who James hangs out with for, in fact, all of his life. Uh, he David Lindsay worked as a herald throughout the 1530s. Um, so he's dealing with literal matters of heraldry, but effectively you're also working as a diplomat, um, working at court. He is formally made the Chief Herald of Scotland, uh, whose title is the Lord Lion King of Arms. Best title ever. Uh, if you go to a conference now and the current Lord Lion King of Arms is there, people will address him as Lion. This is my favourite title ever. Okay, so Lindsay is officially Lord Lion King of Arms from 1542, but he's actually been clearly been doing the job uh, for several years before this. He keeps this title right, right up until his death in 1555. Presumably there's a similar sort of overlap in the last few years where the next Lord Lion King of Arms is, uh, is actually doing the job while Lindsay continues to hold the title. But from the, the later 1540s, in other words, sort of after the death of, uh, not long after the death of James V in 1542, uh, he's clearly sort of edging towards retirement. He's living more often in Fife. He still travels abroad sometimes. He's still sent on important diplomatic missions, uh, but he's in semi-retirement at his family seat of the Mount in Fife. He's living, as you can see on this map, within sort of five miles of his distant relatives, the Lords Lindsay of the Byers, at their seat at Struthers Castle. And this is the period, somewhere in this period, between um, the sort of mid 1440s and his death in 15, uh, so 1540s and his death in 1555. That's the period when this poem, uh, the two poems about Squire and Meldrum were written. Uh, that's the period we're interested in. So when the poems were written, William Meldrum, who is the real Squire Meldrum on whom these poems are based, had been working in the household of the Lord Lindsay at the, Bi at the Byers at their castle in Struthers for almost 30 years. Okay, so he's a regular there. He also was probably born in the early 1480s, so he's the same age, roughly, as Sir David Lindsay. And we also know that Meldrum and Lindsay knew each other. And in fact, Lindsay must have trusted Meldrum because Meldrum's name appears as a witness on two charters confirming land sales for Lindsay and his wife. And those two charters both date from 1541-42, so the period when Lindsay is uh, starting, actually just before he sort of withdraws to uh, spending most of his time in Fife. And both those charters were issued at Struthers Castle, so Meldrum tends to um, act as a witness to charters and documents drawn up at Struthers Castle. He's clearly on the manor and that's, that's where he works. So by the mid 1540s we have our poet Sir David Lindsay and William Meldrum, our squire Meldrum, both in their early 60s. They know each other, they're moving in the same social circles around Cooper and Fife, um, so hanging out together at Struthers Castle, uh, sort of social dues. Since Lindsay refers to Meldrum's death several times in the course of both Squire Meldrum poems, it is not unreasonable to date these poems after the death of your actual William Meldrum. William Meldrum disappears from the records in 1550, so the last thing he witnesses is 25th of July 1550. Um, so the history of Squire Meldrum and the Testament of Squire Meldrum are normally dated circa 1550 or just slightly after. I don't think this is correct and we'll see why later. Uh, this is a question of audience, a question of uh, some conflicting information. Okay, so as for the history itself, what happens in the history? This is the biography of our noble 
young, strong, handsome Squire Meldrum. It starts in 1513, where he joins Aaron's army to fight in France. Um, they stop in Carrickfergus, and na uh, the Navy goes round, uh, stops in Carrickfergus in Ireland. Two soldiers are preparing to rape a maiden, but, no, a maiden, but, but Squire Meldrum comes in and saves her, and he beats them. She tries to become his wife, or failing that is paramour because he doesn't seem to be interested in marrying, but he flees, manages to leave her behind, uh, goes to France with the Scots forces who are opposing the English. He fights in France. He is amazing. Everybody loves Meldrum. He defeats an enormous English champion single-handed. Uh, he finds some dastardly English soldiers besieging noble Scots in a house in town. He beats them. He does amazing things. King Louis XII loves him. French ladies swoon for him, but he decides to go home to Scotland for, for no reason that we're given. He just decides to go back home. He got had enough of the ladies in France. While on his way, his ship is attacked by a much bigger English pirate ship, but it's all right, it's Squire Meldrum, he beats them. Back in Scotland, he arrives, he's celebrated everywhere. Uh, and as he travels around, pro progresses around Scotland, he visits a young widowed lady of Glen Eagles. She's at her castle in Strathern. She falls in love with him. They become lovers, but they can't marry because he's too closely related to her husband, we're told. So sort of all, all left very vague in the poem. Uh, he helps her fend enemies off from her various castles. He wins every battle. But sad days come. One day, a cruel knight who resents their happy union arranges a vicious ambush when Squire Meldrum is, is on his way to Leith. Meldrum, of course, fights valiantly. It's Meldrum. But this time he does not beat them. He is horribly outnumbered and he is left hideously mutilated. He recovers, surprisingly, from this. And in the course of his recovery, he learns the arts of medicine from being cured himself. Uh, and he goes to work for the aged Lord, which is Lord Lindsay of the Byers in Fife. He works as Sheriff Depute in Fife, all round useful man about the castle. He never sees his adored Lady of Strathern again. And we're told in the poem that she remarries against her will. He holds a feast every year before Lent in her honour. He dies peacefully. OK, that is the tale of Squire Meldrum. It's, it's effectively a medieval romance. It's, it's a biography wrapped up as a romance. Then comes the second poem, the Testament. Okay, the Testament of Squire Meldrum. It's it's over two hundred lines long, but almost nobody reads it. It's not nearly as much fun as, or at least initially, as the history. Uh, and also, it sort of clashes with the history, which is why critics who come to it don't really know what to do with it, and they end up going back to the history because that's nice and clear. So, in the Testament, Lindsay does one of the things he does particularly well, which is to pen a character-revealing dramatic monologue as he does in the poem about Cardinal Beaton or um, the irascible court dog Bagge. You know, this is this is the thing he does. And of course, you know, his primary example is the satire of the three estates. I mean, this is this is what he does. He does these sort of dramatic portraits. So in the testament of Squire Meldrum, which follows the history, he has Meldrum himself speaking to the audience. Meldrum comes to take his leave of the world and his social circle and to appoint his executors from amongst the Lindsay family. And he describes at length the kind of funeral he wants. And although he protests repeatedly that he cares nothing for riches or money, and he'd said these things in the, in the he, was, he was portrayed as saying such things in the history as well. So he's supposed to be a really kind, modest guy. In the Testament, he orders this wildly extravagant funeral. Uh, actually on a scale um, of James V's funeral. You can actually sort of compare the details. Uh, so um, I'm going to give you a little flavour of a little, little view of um, where, what Struthers Castle is like now, but you're going to have to imagine this rather more built up than it is now uh, and imagine a performance in the hall here. Okay, so because this is the audience for which uh, the original Squire Meldrum poems was designed. And I'll get back to the question of audience uh, and what it tells us about the poems uh, a bit later. Okay, so this is the very end of the history. This is Squire Meldrum dying, and it's all it's, it's all very sort of straight straight faced. You know, as he lived, so he ended pleasantly till he might endure, till dolent death come to his door, and cruelly with his mortal dart, he struck the squire through the heart. His soul with joy angelical passed to the heaven imperial. Thus, at the strother into Fife, this noble squire lost his life. OK, this is, you know, this this is a moving ending to the history. Uh, but now we're going to meet 
this Squire Meldrum. Okay. Starting off, are you a crest, my friends, in and all, and noble men of whom I am descended, fail not to be at my feast funeral, will throw the world, he trust shall be commended. Through the world. Okay, all right. This is Squire Meldrum talking about the women. He's talking about Venus here, and in my face, sick grace so did in print. All creatures did think me amiable. Women to me, she made me favourable. Was never a lady that looked in my face, but honestly, I did obtain her grace. Okay, not shy about you know, his success with the ladies here. Okay, all creature a what will me commend and pray to God for my salvation. He wants a tombstone made for himself. I pray you take the pain my epitaph to write upon this wise. A bone my grave in golden letters find. Who is paying for this? He's just a squire. Anyway, uh, the most invincible warrior here lies. During his time, quilt one sick lord and prize that through the heavens sprang his noble fame. Victorious William Mildrum was his name. He carries on. Adieu, my lords. I may no longer tarry. And I've actually cut out several lines of adieu this, adieu that. My departing. A what well you will rue, but most of all the fair ladies, ladies again of France, when they hear tell but do that I'm dead, extreme dolor will change their countenance, and for my sack will wear the morning weed. When their novels, when this news does into England spread, of London than the lusty ladies clear, will for my sack mark dull and dreary cheer. Farewell. Ye lame and lamps of lustiness of fair Scotland, adieu, my ladies all, brothers in arms, adieu in general, for me I wot your heart's been full sair. Okay. <laughs> you get the point. This is not the modest man, the modest hero of the history. And this becomes a bit interesting. For well, list to know the art spellicle, let them go read the legend of my life. There shall they find the deeds marshal, how I have stand in money stalwart strife victoriously, etc, etc. And then he goes back to this question of a legend of his life. After the evangel, this is in the, his funeral service he's describing now, and the offertor through all the temple guard proclaim, guard proclaim silence. Then to the pulpit guard an orator pass up and show in open audience, solemnity with ornate eloquence at great leisure. The legend of my life, how I have stand on many stalwart strife. At this point, we realise that what we have just heard previously, i.e. that wonderful history, that fabulous biography of him, you know, as a fighting legend, that's the legend. That is the thing that has been composed to be read at this fabulous funeral, saying what an amazing guy he was. Now, it's not unknown for a chivalric biography to be commissioned for a knight or, or a lord's funeral, and that kind of thing did happen. What is strange here is this characterization of this vain, boastful subject in the Testament talking to the audience, and the fact that it's so at odds with the squire who we'd previously met in that legend, and then realizing that that legend was something that was composed at the orders of our vain, boastful old man who is standing in front of us in the Testament. Okay, so this gives a whole new meaning to what Lindsay tells us at the very beginning of that innocent sounding history. Secrets that I did not know, that noble squire did me show. In other words, I got the details from Squire Meldrum himself. Okay, now that we've met Squire Meldrum, that puts a sort of slightly different cast on these details. So here's our initial problems presented by this text. The Meldrum of the Testament is comically at odds with the hero of the history. And yet, critics to date had usually taken this biography as set out in the history at face value. And this is partly because we know that the real Lindsay and the, and the real Meldrum were acquaintances. And, you know, Lindsay was happy to have Meldrum sign legal documents for him. He must have trusted him. So surely he and Meldrum are friends. And so, you know, that must be a true biography. Also, there are various historical records which confirm the, the truth of at least a bit of what the history says. Well, I mean, significant parts of what the history says. OK, so we've got this problem of unflattering portrayal of Squire Meldrum in the Testament versus very flattering portrayal in the history and how much of the history is true. OK, here's another local man coming in. 
This is Robert Lindsay of Pitscotty, uh, one of the many, many Lindsays of Fife. Uh, so we've got alongside Lindsay's history of Squire Meldrum, which I've just been talking about, in Robert Lindsay's Chronicle, uh, he recounts the history of Meldrum. He, he gives a summary of it. I've put some details side by side here. I'm not going to spend much time on this, um, but it's enough to show us that he's telling roughly the same story, but he is adding details that weren't in Lindsay. In other words, he's not just copying out Lindsay's poem. He's got other information to add. So he adds the name of Lindsay's, oh, oops, sorry. He adds the name of Squire of Eldrum's Lady of Strathern, Marjorie Lawson. Uh, tells us he's the, she's the daughter of Richard Lawson, the provost of Edinburgh, and this can be corroborated. Now we can look these people up. Um, we've got little differences in exactly when Squire Meldrum was attacked, um, and we've got a name for the person who wants to marry, the cruel knight who wants to marry his lady love and who hires somebody to abduct her, although that never happens in the poem, that's a bit weird, and to attack Squire Meldrum. Okay, so that would suggest maybe that you know, this is a known story. Otherwise, you know, he, he can't just have taken it from the poem. Otherwise, he wouldn't have these extra details. Uh, and we can corroborate some of these details that he gives us elsewhere. But we also get problems with corroboration. OK, so here are some historical records. Uh, over here, uh, we have something from the treasurer's accounts. And this is a sort of a settling of a legal fine. And I'll just give you the English there. Uh, it's, it's talking about £40 in partial payment of the total agreed with Master Patrick Lawson with respect to his part in the mutilation of George Haldane, William Meldrum and their companions, and for the malice aforethought literally, uh, with which this mutilation was carried out. OK, so there is our proof that in 1517 there was a violent attack on William Meldrum that left him uh, severely injured. Okay, and barely survived. Eighty pounds is a hell of a fine for somebody to pay in 1517. So that's pretty bad. Um, over here, this is from the Acts of the Lords of Council. Uh, again, 1517. The Lady of Glen Eagles, right? That's our that's our uh, lady love from the the history. The Lady of Glen Eagles be put at freedom and have her free will to pass where she pleases best, and that neither William Meldrum alleged to be her spouse. Master James, nor Master Patrick Lawson, mark her not trouble, nor impediment there till. Now, this is introducing some problems. Okay, we've got the right people, and we've got we've got these Lawsons undertaking the attack, but we now have this decree that neither James or Patrick should hassle her, nor William Meldrum. So on the one hand, we have confirmation that there's an affair happening between her and William Meldrum, but <laughs> she's been given the right to not be bothered by him. So it's not quite clear whether it's her that wants shot of William Meldrum and maybe also these other Lawsons, we'll talk about them in a minute, um, or, or somebody else has intervened. Okay, so we have, in other words, partial con confirmation of the story in um, the story as we have it in the history and partial denial of it. Okay, so as for these people, right, so Master Patrick Lawson, Master James Lawson, Here's a family tree of Meldrum's lady love, right? Here's Marjorie Lawson, and she marries John Haldane, who is Lord of, Glen, um, Lord of Glen, Glen Eagles, right? So that's how she becomes the Lady Glen Eagles. And these are her various brothers, including Patrick Lawson and James Lawson. So that assault on William Meldrum was carried out by these two, yeah, these two university educated brothers of hers. Okay, she married John Haldane in 1508. They have two sons that I can find in the records. There's, so there's the heir, Sir James. Uh, there's a younger son, Archibald. John Haldane himself was killed at Flodden Field in 1513, right? So she's genuinely available uh, when she meets Squire Meldrum. Uh, so, and a wealthy widow, you know, so uh, she's going to get pursued. Okay. Here's another person. Who's this? George Haldane. He's the person who is with William Meldrum at the attack, so he is also attacked. OK, let's have a look at the family tree of her husband. Right. This is who Marjorie marries. OK, uh, and here up here is his uncle George. Uncle George acts as a tutor uh, for their son. OK, so we we're beginning to put together a sort of tangled web of local families who all know each other. And I'm just going to run through little bits and pieces to show you 
uh, how these families are interconnected. I'm not going to go through the details of this, but this is back in 1508 uh, when John Haldane marries Marjorie Lawson. So apparently long before Squire Meldrum has come processing through Strathairn and meets this lady in the castle in 1513. Right, He's making arrangements for his lands, uh, arrangements in favour of his new spouse, Marjorie Lawson. Uh, and if you look at the witnesses attached to this, there is one Archibald Meldrum of Bins and also George Haldane. And that is, you know, this is the George Haldane who is later going to be caught in the ambush with Will William Meldrum. Who is Archibald Meldrum? It's William Meldrum's father. Okay, so there's, this is, this is a, a land grant from back in 1506. And one of the witnesses is named as William Meldrum, his son and heir apparent. OK, so in other words, if we go, if, 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 we, if we look back on this, you know, we've got uh, William's father witnessing documents to do with Marjorie's marriage to her first husband. All of these people know each other. Even more people know each other. Here is just a little bit of evidence for Lawson's and Haldane's hanging out together long after uh, the ambush has happened in 1517 and after William Meldrum and Marjorie Lawson never see each other again. She will go on to marry twice, by the way. She marries somebody called Luke Sterling uh, and she marries again in the 1540s. So she's not interested in going back to him as far as we can see. Uh, so this is uh, James Lawson of High Riggs. This is Marjorie's nephew, James. Uh, son of the late Robert Lawson, that's, that's, that's her brother, and Marjorie's son. OK, so they're working together and this is in 1539. Uh, 1542, we have another document where James Haldane of Glen Eagles, Marjorie's son, and his cousin James Lawson of High Riggs are witnessing something together. And then there's some more, Law more Haldanes in here. OK, so these two families remain closely interconnected. Uh, and this is drawing in even more people. These, this is showing how the Stirlings are all part of this mix. And remember that Pitscotti had said that it was a Stirling who had arranged for the ambush to happen. Okay. But we now know the ambush actually was taken, was happened because of the Lawsons, not because of the Stirlings. Right. Uh, so Lawsons and Stirlings connected. I'm just going to jump over these. If anybody's curious, you, you can you can have these slides and have a look at these. Uh, and even the Lords Lindsay know all these people. So if we look at a retour from 1525, 26, so not long after the ambush, uh, this is confirming John Lindsay as the heir of the late Sir John Lindsay, sort of son, son himself of Patrick Lindsay. So this, this is confirming the succession of the Lords Lindsay of the Byers. And if you look at the jurors on there, we've got John Sterling of Keir, who, who Lindsay, had named, uh, Lindsay of Pitscotty had named as the attacker, but we know wasn't. And we've got George Haldane of Kippen. OK, so we know that the Lindsays know the Haldanes, know George Haldane, who was caught up in the ambush. They know the Stirlings. Okay. In other words, they know everybody they need to know to know what really happened in the story. So if they are being presented with the history of Squire Meldrum, unlike us, they can sit there enjoying the dramatic irony of comparing it to what they know of the real story and who really attacked whom and whether Marjorie really wanted William Meldrum back or not. OK, so the 1517 ambush, we now know that it didn't happen quite like this. Okay, this, is, this, is, this is not right. You know, it's not Luke Sterling uh, arranging for an attack. Uh, it's not Luke, certainly not, Luke, uh, not, not John Sterling who does the, the attacking. And we know that the Lindsays, the Lord Lindsay of the Byers, did know what happened. OK. Most of Lindsay's poems hit print almost as soon as he's written them, you know, as the ink is drying effectively. So, you know, he writes a poem, you know, Cardinal Beaton is assassinated in 1547. By 1548, we already have a print of his uh, tragedy of the Cardinal. That's the speed with which Lindsay normally hits print. Lindsay dies in 1555. By the late 1550s, we've got printers attempting to put out complete works of Lindsay. I mean, he's a real literary celebrity. By 1568, Henry Charters of Edinburgh has put out an expanded complete works of Lindsay. In all of these, there's no sign of Meldrum poems. It's only by 1582, Henry Charters revises his works again, and in the table of contents, he lists both Meldrum poems, but they're actually missing from all the copies of it. So, I mean, even supposing that it was published by 1582, that's you know, just about a 30 year gap. 
that, that's very unusual for a Lindsay poem. And that suggests that these poems were originally written for a small coterie audience. Okay, that it's initially circulating amongst you know, the, the Lindsay circle and their friends. In fact, the earliest copy we have of the poem dates from 1594. That's the earliest surviving print. Okay, but that publication history would tally with something that was originally a sort of in-joke that was, that was performed for a small audience. And then if we have a look at these lines from the beginning of the Testament, this is Squire Meldrum uh, naming his preferred executors. So he's got David Earl of Crawford, so he's a Lindsay. Uh, remember, this is just somebody who works for Lord Lindsay, right? You know, he's <laughs> he's not a lord himself. Uh, he would like uh, Lord Lindsay himself, the current Lord Lindsay, John Lord Lindsay, my master special. And then the third, he wants Sir Walter Lindsay. Okay, so Walter Lindsay, Lord of St John, Knight of Torfican. Okay, he is the chief of the Knights Hospitaller for for Scotland. Okay, the Lord, the, the Knights of St John. Uh, so very important person in the kingdom. Okay, these are the people he wants to be his executors and organise his funeral. Okay, this brings us to a question. That last person, Sir Walter Lindsay, throws a bit of a curveball in trying to date the poem. Remember how the history ends by telling us that you know, he died at Struthers in Fife. Okay, so normally the poems are dated after 1550 when we know the real William Meldrum died. But in those lines, if I just go back, he's asking Sir Walter Lindsay to be one of his executors supposedly. Won't read you through all these documents, but here is the proof that Sir Walter Lindsay was dead by March 1547. OK, so we've got incompatible dates. Either the poems are written after 1550 and for some reason Lindsay and his his fictional Meldrum is pretending that Walter is still alive, you know, sort of zombie at the feast, or the poems are written before Walter dies, so all of the executors are still alive, and therefore Meldrum is also still alive. So the fiction is that this is Meldrum's epitaph, you know, that this is, the, the, that it then becomes a very different thing. It becomes, in fact, something that could be performed to an audience that might include Meldrum. Okay, so here is uh, the, the main editor of Lindsay's works at the beginning of the 20th century, Hamer, obviously very disturbed by this. Hamer had really wanted everything in the biography to be absolutely true, and he was the first person who dug up all those documents and found all the contradictions that I've just been talking about. Um, what he didn't have were the documents that proved Walter's date of death. Right. So he said, I think, therefore, that either Sir Walter must have resigned the preceptorship in 1547 rather than just died uh, or, or else um, Sir James Sanderlands, this is referring to some details here, uh, that, uh, it, it, that perhaps perhaps he was just told that he would become the preceptor when Walter died, not that Walter had actually died in 1547. Um, but, you know, he's very worried about Lindsay's uh, honesty and historical fact. You know, things, everything Lindsay says must be true. And yet we have incompatible things. Um, and he, he concludes by saying, um, the, but the report that he's just quoting doesn't reproduce the documents. Well, in the previous slide, I just showed you the details of the documents, so he can't get away with that. Uh, we have these incompatible dates. Now, I'm going to take you to a preface that was written spe specifically for the performance of the satire of three estates that was made in Cooper in 1552. So there's a text called the Cooper Bands, which was basically like a movie trailer for the performance. So it's, it's, it's come ye, come ye, it tells you, you know, many, many times, it tells you it's gonna start at seven in the morning, have your breakfast early, you're gonna be here, have a pee beforehand, because you're gonna be sat for hours. Uh, so it's, it's this advertising and it gives you a little, a little flavor of what the actors are like. So we've got a fool, we've got a clerk, and we've got this character called Finlow of the Fit Band. Okay, so this is a character who comes striding up, and I want you to be thinking of those quotations I gave you earlier from the testament of Squire Meldrum, so how he sounded. So here's Finlaw of the Fit Band. My name, sirs, well do you understand? They call me Finlaw of the Fit Band of the Foot inf Infantry, a noble man of war. Okay, when Englishmen come into this land, had I been there with my breast brand sword, without any help, but mine alone on Pinky Craigs, that's the Battle of Pinky Clough, 1547, I should have raven them all in rags and laid on scalp for scalp. Okay, quite pleased with himself. You know, perhaps all this is true. Here is Finlaw a bit later on. This is the sword that slew grey steel, not half a mile beyond Canule. 
This is uh, Edgar and Grime or The Legend of Greysteel. We see he's referring to a very popular romance of the time. Ah, was that noble campion that slew Sir Bevis of Southampton? Sir Bevis of Hampton, very popular Middle English romance that was circulating in Scotland. Hector of Troy, Gawain, Gaulius had never half the mickle hardiness. I'm fabulous, la la la. What I've put beside it are lines from the history of Squire Meldrum, and you can see he's using exactly the same. This is this is supposedly describing our squire, absolutely straight. You know, this worthy squire, Coradrius, might be compared to classical hero Titius, uh, Roland, sort of Song of Roland, Roland with Brandwell, and we've got Gawain, and we've got Golibras, which is the same as Goliath. Oliver Farambras, you know, we've got Crusader romances. Uh, I what he fought that day as well, as did Sir Grimm against Grey Steel. So exactly the same references. After Finlaw makes a speech in the Cooper Bands, the fool comes along. Uh, My lord, pay him that wore a crown of thorn, a mere coward was never since God was born. So he's talking about Finlaw. Ah, can him wail for all his boasts and cracks. How about he now be like a captain clad? A pinky cluch, he was the first that fled. Attack on hand or a steer of the stead before I leave this place, this crack and carl to flee with a sheep head. And then he brings out a sheep's head, waves it in front of Finlaw, who is terrified and runs away and completely destroys all his impression of being a hero. This is the kind of character that we also see in the Testament of Squire Meldrum. I think what is going on in this pair of poems, the history of Squire Meldrum, which looks like the kind of chivalric biography that somebody with a healthy ego might try to commission for themselves, and then the testament with our dramatised Squire Meldrum, I think what we have, remember this, is what you would call these days a roast. Uh, this is a roast of a perfectly living William Meldrum sitting in the audience, probably mates with David Lindsay, probably famous for boasting about his past. Oh, I was a great man with a sword. Oh, I, 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 you were. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. In other words, these are local jokes for local people. And the thing that makes the poem so difficult to interpret now is that we are not those local people. We can't sit there listening to the history and think, yeah, OK, what really happened? Because we don't know exactly what happened. We know from records that it wasn't exactly as it appears in the history. And we can see the disparity between the Testament and the history. But we don't know all the backstory because the original audience didn't need to. In Struthers, those local jokes were for local people. Okay. Thank you. now i need to unshare <laughs> thank you very much rhiannon that is absolutely fabulous talk uh really enjoyed that so i am now going to go into the q a and i see we've had a few questions already which is fabulous <laughs> i'm going to start with an anonymous question which i think is great it is do we know where william meldrum's tomb is and did he have the headstone he requested? <laughs> he definitely didn't get the headstone we requested as far as we know. <laughs> I think that was uh, the gold letters and the marble and everything else. Uh, I don't think anybody was going to be paying for that for him. Um, there is a much later, uh, there is an estate, the Blair's estate out by Loch Leven. Uh, and there is a plaque that was put up in 18th century, I think, it was 18th century, on the basis of the history of Squire Meldrums, kind of ignoring the testament because that's embarrassing. They don't know what to make of it. But there is a plaque saying, you know, this this was once, I think it says, I think it says this was once the home of William Meldrum. I haven't actually been out there, but it, there is um, a much later stone commemorating uh, William Meldrum of, of poem fame. Grand, thanks very much. There's another question here from Wendy. She she says you talk of Lindsay as rushing into print, but yeah. what exactly were the printing, copying and circulation arrangements available in Scotland at that time? Well, the very first printers we have in Scotland um, are Chapman and Miller. So the, with the earliest prints we have surviving date from 1508. OK, and there's there's then we have very rare survivals of Scottish prints, usually from Edinburgh, from, you know, there's there's the scraps from 1530 printing, for example. What will often happen is we won't have an early Scottish print, but we will have a London print. So we have to assume that it's come out in Scotland as well. Uh, and occasionally you'll find evidence of this. So um, Testament of Papingo, another poem that he wrote in 1530s, that the earliest print we have of that is is from London, I mean, a complete print. 
um, and Squire, uh, the, the, the tragedy of the Cardinal. Obviously, the English are very, very interested in what's going on, um, sort of Catholic versus nascent Protestantism in, in Scotland. That is printed in London in 1548, you know, so a year after the actual ass assassination, never mind the writing of a poem. Um, but it's generally, I mean, uh, Edinburgh would be the first port of call for printing. And there are, you know, we have records, although we have very few surviving prints, we do have records of printers there. And by the 1560s, the Edinburgh printing is becoming much more active again. So 15, 1580s, 1590s is a real sort of zenith of printing Scottish works in Edinburgh. And then we also start getting prints from places like Glasgow and St Andrews, actually. St Andrews had a printing house. Fabulous. Thank you. Actually, on that, I'm curious. This is a question from me. Where are these poems to be seen? Where could we see them, either print or reproduction? But more interestingly, are there any records in Lindsay's hand? Ah, we have uh, one diplomatic letter from, I think, is it 1536, 1538? It's definitely the 1530s, um, which is signed by Lindsay. So we do have a Lindsay signature. Yeah, and this is when he's, I think he's Snowden Herald at that point. Um, he's not Lion King of Arms yet. That's not how he signs himself. So that that's one one confirmed signature. You can see his handwriting. Um, I, think, I can't remember where the document itself is held. London, I think. Um, sure. I can set up later if someone's desperate to know. Um, and th as for the prints themselves, um, if uh, if the National Library of Scotland will let you at them, they've got some. <laughs> They're prints, so there's more than one copy of several. Um, but early English books online. If you can have a look at that and type in Lindsay, you'll be able to see um, photographs of these prints. Thanks very much. Another question is, um, is there evidence of Sir David and cousin Robert discussing theatre or poetry themselves with each other? <laughs> in a word, no, there isn't any evidence for this. Um, we don't know. I mean, Robert Pitscotty's chronicle he's writing is around about 1570. And remember, Lindsay's died in 1555. Uh, and Lindsay's quite young when he's writing his chronicle. So um, if they discussed it, you know, it would have been Lindsay as a toddler. <laughs> I mean, Lindsay Pitscotty as a toddler. Um, there isn't there isn't enough of an overlap for them to have had that adult conversation about you know, literary tastes and etc. Fabulous. Well, the questions are coming in thick and fast. And Rachel asks, how frequent is it that documentary evidence can be used to disprove chronicle versions of history? Um, well, in Scotland, our, our sources are thinner on the ground, it's fair to say, than England. So, for example, the Treasury accounts, and that, that's quite a useful source of just you know, bills for things. And it's, in this case, you know, we found a bill for um, what Patrick Lawson owed for his assault. Um, but the Treasurer's accounts stop after Flodden for a while. So there's nothing for 1514. And there's not so many records. So it, it's a bit haphazard. You know, I mean, there's there might be another chronicle account. Again, there's fewer chronicles from Scotland. Um, but the, the kinds of places you go looking are the Treasurer's accounts, um, uh, records of the Lord's Council, things like that, the Exchequer accounts, um, but that's not going to, it depends what era of history you're looking at because none of those are available from, you know, sort of before 1400 or in fact much after that, you know, they, they only become uh, common for, for this period really. Um, yeah, so, so it can be very difficult tracing the truth of these things. It's really unusual to have something really specific for a poem like this, um, but of course it doesn't, it, it both corroborates and disproves simultaneously. <laughs> Sure. Actually, it, it, it does put me in mind of um, what you do is putting together real life crime drama. Um, you know, the, the story you've just told is, is a crime drama to rival the fiction writings of Val McDermott with a wee bit of, e of EastEnders yeah. in there as well, which is it's absolutely fascinating. So is this an aspect of your work you really loved? Is this something that the investigation side of it? Yeah, I often describe what I do as literary forensics, and it's partly because I'm an editor. And so I was I was studying this poem because I was editing it. And because I'm editing it, I have to do things like say what date the poem is. And that was, as you can see, a huge question. Um, and I have to, you know, I'm writing footnotes about all the names that come up. Who is this person? You know, do we have a real person? Oh, my God, we almost do, but not quite. And oh, we have another account in Lindsay of Pitscotty, but it's not quite the same. But he gives some names so you can follow up Marjorie, you know. Um, yeah, that's that's why I like editing, because you you can't avoid those questions. I'm not doing 
and, and not just doing sort of large literary interpretations. I'm actually trying to tack down factual elements. So yeah, forensics is is about the best description of it, really. And I do that for the linguistic side of things as well, although that didn't come into this talk, you know, trying to date things by linguistic elements or could it really have been written here? Is the language consistent with that? You know. Well, I'm glad you talked about the linguistics because that segues beautifully into my next question, actually, <laughs> which is about when you were speaking, when you were actually speaking in Scots mm. in the poems, it came across as a very, very lyrical language. It's it really is very beautiful to listen to. And it seems to me that there are particular languages that share this lyrical predisposition. Do these have common roots with Scots or is it coincidental? Spanish comes to mind, for example. I think you can make any language sound lyrical <laughs> in, in, in a short answer. Really, I, I could have read them out um, without paying attention to the meter in which it's written. I could have missed it as scribes often do. I could have mangled the meter slightly. Um, I could not have declaimed them and then they wouldn't have sounded quite so much that way. Um, I think it's very, very hard to give a character to a language the way you might try and assign a character to a person that French is somehow inherently more lyrical. Or I mean, there are there are technical features of language. You know, so French, for example, that just it literally takes more words to say the same thing. That is just a feature of French grammar. There are more little words that go in between and, you know, there. Um, so Scots can be as as English can be very, um, very condensed. And that's that's one of the sort of attractive features of it. Uh, vernacular Scots can be particularly condensed, but I mean, that's the same if you slip into sort of local dialects of uh, of of English. You know, that's uh, Lindsay likes to play with different uh, different levels of um, dialect in his writings. And that's one of the fun things about him. You know, he'll go from a very formal register, which is really kind of the equivalent of Morningside accent and not much more Scots than that, right the way to the other end of the scale where he's using real sort of rough dialect words uh, where it's going to be impenetrable uh, to somebody who knows English but has never been to Scotland. You know, it's you know where the language is very different. Uh, and and he, like like the other older Scots poets, will play with this scale you know, in the same way that modern speakers can. You know, you can slip right down into dialect and then go very, 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 very posh and everything and not dialect at all. And, you know, we can all do it. And so could they. <laughs> Absolutely. Fair enough. Uh, I think there's one last week comment here that um, Ian is suggesting that this will make this makes him think of the portrayal of Sir John Falstaff. I'm not sure if that. Yeah. Yeah, and it makes me think of that as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And time for one short question as well is um, where are the Meldrums, a very well known family in this part of Fife? Um, I think there must have been. There's quite a lot of them. So tracking which Meldrum was which was a bit of a nightmare because there's quite a few Meldrums. They all call themselves either William or Archibald. And then there's the odd James thrown in there and trying to work out who's who and whether you've got the same guy or whether it's just another Archibald Meldrum or another William Meldrum. It was a bit of a nightmare. So there's lots of branches of Meldrums. They're very big in Cleesh. So Cleesh and Bins is the title that William Meldrum and the poem has. And we can document lots of Meldrums in Cleesh, but we can also document Meldrums down in the bins uh, down near Linlithgow. <laughs> you know, there's, Meldrum is quite a common name. And as I said, because they all use the same four names, <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite difficult to tell uh, who's who, but there's certainly a lot of them which suggests they're, they're quite well known you know, and, they're, and they're relatively wealthy. The only reason we hear about them is because it's all these charters being drawn up for land grants and land sales, etc. So, you know, they're movers and shakers. Fabulous. Well, look, thank you very much for that. It really was fascinating. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to finding out more uh, in later dates. So it's down to me now to actually introduce um, Bill Pagan. He is the chair of the Cooper Development Trust and the SKEO Three Estates Cooper. Um, and he's going to say a few words towards the end of this session. Bill, across to you. Thank you very much, Barry. It's been a real treat for the eight Cooper and District organisations this evening. Um, we approached the university to explore the possibility of talks on Old Scots in our area, and here we are with tonight's event having happened. Uh, what wonderful support we've had from the university's academics and from the buyer, whose publicity and hosting has been wonderful for us. Um, the eight organisations have been encouraged uh, by their in their endeavours by national 
organizations as well as by um, the university and other local organizations. For example, um, the National Library of Scotland, which has been mentioned tonight, um, Scottish Opera, and the Scots Language Resource Network, which is also offered to provide some speakers for us. Not forgetting St Andrews University Special Collections, who catalogue the archives of the Royal Borough of Coopers um, all the way from uh, 1360s to the end of the borough in 1975. Other talks will follow. And next Tuesday's is by Dr Bess Rhodes uh, on the language and protest in 16th century Fife continuing our theme of the old Scots language in our area. I hope you've all signed up for Bessie's talk. Back to tonight. We are most grateful to Barry Stewart for chairing and moderating this evening and to Carl and Dave, Callum and B for their IT skills without whom uh, we would all have been floundering. Thank you so much. But of course, our main thanks are to our speaker, Rhiannon Purdy, and thank you so much. That was a fascinating uh, talk, very learned and but very well and easily put over and of particular interest to local people because those names that you were mentioning and the places are all of course part of our culture and uh, this was absolutely fascinating. So thank you so much. Um, you've laid the foundations for our subsequent events and what a way to start celebrating Old Scots in Cooper and District. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you and good night, everybody. Thank you, Barry. Good night. <laughs>